on, and we'll call the May Board of Health meeting to order. For the record, there is a copy of the Open Meetings Act on the back walls there in that sectional room. Uh, also, for health purposes, there's an automatic defibrillator on the wall back there if somebody needs it. Um, for that, and now we'll call to order the meeting. Sunday. Okay. Commissioner Alex Peters. Rogers. Here. Wade. Here. For the record, I do have the official notice of publication. Uh, item two is approval of the April minutes. Is there a motion? So moved. There's a motion, a second. 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 Roll call. Rogers. Yes. Uh, item three is a public comment. Um, I see no one here on a public comment. With that, we'll go on to item four, which is approval of the action items. There's items A, B, and C. Is there a motion to approve item, those items? So moved. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. A second. Roll call. Wade? Yes. Commissioner Alex? Yes. Rogers? Yes. Uh, item five is uh, issues for discussion and the uh, coronavirus uh, update. Dr. Ford. Good morning, board members. Can you hear me? I guess so. So first of all, uh, mm -hmm. I would like to talk to you a little bit about the data in regards to uh, COVID-19. As of uh, yesterday morning, actually, the latest data that we have, we have now a total of 200 2,570 cases uh, in Douglas County. When you look at it for the state of Nebraska, the state of Nebraska had yesterday, last night on their dashboard, 10,846 cases. So Douglas County has 25% of those cases. When we look at the age range, uh, again, I always like to see who is really most affected by this. We see 51% of our cases are in the 25 to 49 years old. And the next highest one is 50 to 64, 23%. We have 13% of our cases in 5 to 24. And the lowest number is the percentage is above 65 years old. We have 9%. So that is good news. It see, we are seeing that the cases we are seeing in our community are mainly middle-aged uh, working individuals. When we look at the rate per 10,000, and that is usually a measure that I think is a good measure, across the U.S. there is uh, uh, 46 cases per 10,000. That's kind of the average overall in the United States. In Douglas County, we are at 45 cases per 10,000. When you look at some of our counties that we know have been really affected by this in, in Nebraska, we see Hall County at 233 cases per 10,000, and we see Dakota County at 737 cases per 10,000. So compared to the 45 uh, cases that we see in Douglas County. When we look at race and ethnicity, uh, I think you have heard me talk about this. It is really important in public health that we try to see who is most affected by a disease, or in this case, by this outbreak, by this virus. And we see 48% of our cases are in our Hispanic population. Of course, I need to tell you only 12.8% of that uh, uh, population it makes up our community. So we are seeing that that community is disproportionately affected. They have four times higher cases than they actually are represented in our community. That's important because if we need to do measures or interventions, that's where we want inter interventions to occur, to really try to protect that community. Our uh, next population is in our Caucasian. We have 17% of our cases in our Caucasian uh, community. 
Asians make up 15% of our cases. However, if we look at it in regards to what they are making up, they only make up 4.2% of our community. So again, disproportionately affected by this. African American make up 10% of our cases, but in reality, they are 11.4%. So that is a good news. We see a, a community that is less, a little bit less affected or at least closer to what they are represented in our community. Native American, the same uh, uh, story there. 1% uh, of our Native American population is affected. However, they make up 2.5% of our total population. So we are seeing a decrease uh, in that. It is important, and I know, uh, you know, I always am transparent with the data that I want to share, and I'm transparent with this too. Uh, not really to point fingers by any means to a community, but to say we need to embrace that community and we need to see that resources go to that community. So when we look at it, uh, I look over the last three weeks. The last three weeks have really seen an increase of cases in our community. And the highest positivity rate actually has been last week. Also, however, on the good side is we also have seen the highest number of testing being done over the last three weeks. And I think more testing we do, more are we identifying cases, and more can we do contact tracing and isolation. Uh, so that is really important to us. So total uh, case numbers, because uh, I get questioned a lot, how many tests have been done in Douglas County? We have a total of 18,083 tests that are being done. That is three, uh, potentially 3% of our population. That's not where we want to be, but I think we need to start measuring and say, okay, this is where we are now. Hopefully more testing is going to come into our community. When we look at it, uh, what, how many tests have been done in Nebraska, I looked at it, 72,333 tests. So 25% of those tests have been done in Douglas County. I think we always need to compare that. When we look at the positivity rate last week, I just told you we have done more testing. And what does more testing do? It identifies more individuals, but also potentially can bring the positivity rate down. That's what we have seen last week. So the positivity rate last week was 11.6%, and compare that to the to previous uh, weeks where we were at 22%. We also do a calculation which means the doubling rate. How long does it take for the case rates to double? Uh, and our staff calculates that on a, on a running average, and we now have 10.8 days it takes for our cases to double. When we talk about testing, and I think we all hear about where is testing going on and so on, testing is going on at private health care providers. So if individuals have symptoms, uh, they should call their health care provider and they should be able to be referred to testing. So that's number one. Number two is Test Nebraska, which is this uh, uh, implementation that the governor has put in place, and it started on the 12th of May of this month. Starting, started in Omaha. Omaha had the first site at the Civic Center, and you have heard about it at the parking lot. So far, Test Nebraska has done 2,475 tests, and they have had 57 positives in our community for a positivity rate of 2.3%. So that is the second side. The third that you have heard us talk about is the National Guard. So uh, through some uh, requests through the governor's office, the National Guard uh, came to South Omaha because One World, honestly, was overwhelmed with individuals who wanted to be tested. So the National Guard has been here on the first day, uh, which was last Thursday. They tested 206 individuals, and we have those tests back. 40 of them were positive, a positivity rate of 
We did testing again on Sunday, 300 uh, tests were done. On Monday, 300 tests, and yesterday, 207 tests. So all together now, the guard has done 1,000 tests through the drive through they have in South Omaha, right, kind of across the street from One World. We don't have results back uh, from some of the other days. We have also reached out to Charles Drew and One World and provided them with more testing and said, you know, we actually open up the criteria for testing for your site so that individuals can go and be tested at those sites, especially those who do not have a private health care provider. So Charles Drew has started this week uh, on Monday to test more than 100 individuals. One World has been testing close to 100 individuals over the last two, three weeks. So that is available uh, for our, some of our minority population. Then I also want to uh, do a, a shout out to uh, CHI on 132nd and Center. They have really been an excellent clinic to work with so that when we, through tracing, uh, identifying individuals who need to get tested, we are actually being able to call them and get these individuals in for tested. That is great. They have been a community partner that we really want to point out. The other thing is CHI at Cumming Street, uh, which is behind the Creighton campus. They also are now uh, broadening up out their testing. And NOAA, the North Omaha uh, Alliance for Health, they also are going to do testing uh, in North Omaha. We are looking for more opportunities where testing could occur. We know Test Nebraska, which is now at the CHI Center, is looking for different sites. And uh, we are working on where would it make sense to move them uh, over time. And so we are looking for that. Uh, we are also in discussion with Nebraska Medicine to see if they could do a drive-through sites. We have done some special testing, however, at uh, uh, two of the shelters. Uh, we, really, we tested, I think by now, both shelters two times. In the beginning, when they had COVID cases, and then the best practice is to test them again, those that were negative between seven to 10 days after the first, uh, first testing. And that is because you really have a very vulnerable population, but you also have a population who moves a lot and they needed to be able to isolate and quarantine individuals because they have people coming to those shelters on a regular basis, which is quite different in long-term care. I just want to point that out because somebody may say, well, why are you not doing this in long-term care? Long-term care is really uh, is a population that uh, remains there. It isn't moving uh, around. It isn't going in and out besides staff. And so the recommendations are a little bit different. I just want to share with you, uh, most of the long-term care facilities have worked with the Infection Control Assessment Program, which is a program that comes out of Nebraska Medicine. That program provides consultation to long-term care facilities in regards to infection control. It looks how these uh, long-term care facilities are set up, what is the capacity for them to isolate and quarantine individuals, and so on. So in many of the long-term care facilities in Douglas County, we have been lucky that one of these teams, which is made up of infection control nurses and specialists who actually are well known around the world, uh, that they have been able to go into those facilities, look at the facility and make recommendations. They find different things in every facility. Every facility is slightly different, but their recommendations have really helped. They also have gone into uh, meatpacking or food production facilities to do the same thing, to look at the infection control uh, practices, the protocols that those facilities have, and, and really make recommendations to them. And in one of the cases, they have gone back and they have said, you know, we made those recommendations for you, but have you followed up with them? Because, you know, you can make recommendations. If nobody follows up, it isn't doing any good. So really that, uh, that feedback loop, uh, they have done very well. So we are very fortunate to have these teams uh, here in town. 
when we look at, uh, you know, uh, I just heard this morning again, and I do think it is so uh, appropriate. If we do not have appropriate isolation and quarantine, if individuals cannot do that because of the way they are set up or their household is set up, it isn't going to do us any good. So we really need a multifaceted approach. And what uh, we have done, the state of Nebraska has done, is called the Accommodation Project. The Accommodation Project is made up of several uh, things. First of all, there are hotels that have been designated and contracted with in every community. I think it may not in very small communities, but definitely in Douglas County. Those hotels are available for emergency responders, healthcare provider, correction officer, long-term uh, community, long-term health community uh, workers, uh, they, so that they can go to work and go home. Instead of going home, they can go to the hotel and they can go back to work the next day, so that they are not mixing with the, with the household they are at. And this has worked really well. We have more than 20 individuals in Douglas County uh, in those hotels. But now the next step is what they have also done. They have said, as we treat healthcare workers, we also should treat individuals who work in industries where it is a little bit at a high, where they are at a higher risk. And so at this time, the same uh, hotels are also there for individuals who work in the packing industry. There is a process in place. These facilities need to give lists of workers who really want to stay in these hotels. But so this is all to minimize the transmission from this virus. And then the third component of this project is the UNO dormitories. And you may say, what are the UNO dormitories doing? They are there for the general public because it may be that uh, somebody cannot go home and quarantine. They are being told, or they are being told by the health department, you should quarantine. And they say, you know, I live in a small household, I don't have the opportunities, or I have a pregnant wife at home, I have risk factors at home, I have elderly at home. So those, uh, the UNO uh, dormitories are available for those individuals. There is a form that people fill out. They then need to uh, fit the criteria, and they can move, in, move into those uh, facilities. So I really want, uh, want to share that. Last, also, we look at the death. What, how many deaths, unfortunately, have happened in our community? And that's always, uh, to me, a, a real, uh, real hardship to talk about. We have up to now 24 uh, cases of uh, death that is COVID-related. That means COVID-related means on the death certificates that physicians and cor coroners fill out, COVID-19 has been indicated on those, uh, on those death certificates. Doesn't mean that the person died because of COVID-19, but it means it is one of the conditions that are on there. You hear a lot of discussion on, on the national media about that. The 24 cases that we have are out of a Nebraska total of 132 total cases. So that means actually 18% of the cases we have in Douglas County, which is good. Remember I said 25% of the total cases we have in Douglas County and 25% of the testing that is going on in Nebraska. But we only have, not only, every case is, is a tragedy, but we have 18% of the totals. When you look at the age range uh, in our uh, uh, unfortunate population who uh, had to die, 74% are above 65 years of, old, of age. 16% are 50 to 64, 10% are 25 to 49 years old. When we look at it at race and ethnicity, 68% of those are in our Caucasian population, 21% in our African American, and 10% in our Hispanic population. When we look at the comorbidities, because we always say, you know, those who have comorbidities are more likely to die from this virus. Uh, respiratory illness is our highest comorbidity, and by that we mean asthma, underlying uh, respiratory illnesses. 42% of our cases have respiratory illnesses. 
37% of our cases have renal disease and 26% have diabetes. One out of every fourth who died in our community had as an underlying illness diabetes. Uh, this cardiovascular disease, no surprise, 16% of our cases have cardiovascular disease. What is surprising to me, only 10% of our cases have immunological disorders, an immune, uh, a suppressed immune system, so to say. That's 10%. Also, only 10% of our cases have cancer as an underlying condition. Let me also talk about something a little bit uh, more positive. That is, uh, we are looking at the cases that have recovered in Douglas County. And right now, we have 471 cases who have recovered. And you may say, how is that being determined? That is be being determined by a, a person from the health department who's calling every single person, and we go back uh, about three weeks after they have start onset of their symptoms, and we ask them, have your symptoms, are your symptoms gone, for example? When they say, well, you know, majority is gone, but I still have this lingering cough. They are telling us that they are not recovered. So then we put, we put them in a different uh, tile, so to say, and we'll call them back. So 471 have said to us that they have recovered. They do not have any symptoms anymore. And from those who have recovered, just kind of a, a quick breakdown, as we would expect, 58% uh, more than half of them are in our 25 to 49 years old. 19% are 50 to 64 years old. Can go down the line, only 9% of our individuals above 65 years old have said that they have recovered. When we look at our race of those recovered, we see 40% uh, are white, 36% are Hispanic, 15% are African American, and 7.1% are Asians. It's, it's really always good that we are clear with what our data shows. As you have heard, we are very interested, and in that was kind of flattening the curve so we are not overwhelming our hospital systems. And what you are seeing is uh, now we are seeing an increase in the burden of our hospital system since we have an increase in our, in our cases. And what you are seeing is that when we look at our med, uh, medical and search beds, we are seeing uh, we have 407, uh, 412 beds available in our community out of a total of 1,339. So that is an occupancy rate of 69%, or you can turn it around and say 31% of our beds are available at this time. We are looking at this number very closely, and so does the governor, because uh, we do not want to come to a, a point where we are overwhelming our system. This is the lowest rate we have seen uh, at this time. When we look at total COVID patient inpatients that we have in hospital, we now have 137 patients who are in hospitals. Two weeks ago, that was 74 patients. So we have close to doubled compared to two weeks ago. When we look at ventilator use, that's always a good story that I like to tell. We have at this time 122 ventilators that are being used out of a total of 374. 122 out of a total of 374. So you could say we have 250 ventilators available as of today. So that's a nice resource. However, what we are seeing is that 44 of those ventilators are being used by COVID-19 patients. And two weeks ago, that was 16. So we are starting to see uh, how that increase is occurring. I would like to share with the board just uh, a quick summary about all the different operations that we have around this in the health department. I think that is, uh, is important for you as a board to know. So we are the recipient of what you call the hub for PPE, personal protective uh, equipment. And uh, I cannot say enough for our staff who has really 
put together a team who's working on this and breaking down what we are getting from the state. So these orders go into the state. We then receive shipments, and we then are making sure that everyone who requested one, who requested PPE, dependent on healthcare workers, it has really to be somebody who takes care of COVID-19 patients. Those are the individuals or have them in their facility. Those are priority uh, filling of this. So uh, we have uh, we have we distributed all of it. We seem to be pretty good on PPE in general, and that's also the uh, kind of the the thought that the uh, governor has. Every PPE purchase go comes from the governor. They buy in bulk. Pretty soon, early on, we have found that that is the most effective way uh, to, uh, to buy this, these procedures. Now I have to tell you, there are sometimes hiccups. Sometimes the, the uh, PPE that they are purchased are not high quality and they need to go back. So, you know, we are working through those issues. But at the same time, I also want to share with you, we have had donations uh, in our community from uh, uh, private foundations, and we have given out 70,000 masks for the general population, mainly in North Omaha and in South Omaha. So we are really trying to put our resources in the areas uh, most affected. I want to talk to you a little bit, as uh, I probably don't have to share with you, but it's epidemiology and uh, uh, communicable disease contact tracing that is really at the forefront of this. And those staff members are putting in a lot of work. Epidemiology is doing all the data analysis, and as you can imagine, this is huge. This is a huge project. We are getting so many laboratory reports from different laboratory uh, laboratories, and everyone just has a little bit of different uh, interface to make sure that it gets into our data system. And then once it is in there, they are doing an analysis through the SAS program to really try to give, provide me and to provide the community the data that you all are seeing on our dashboard. That doesn't come out very easy, uh, I tell you. Uh, so I just want to uh, tell you how proud uh, I am. Uh, sometimes laboratory results that we are going, that are, we are getting, they are not from Douglas County, they are from Salby or our surrounding, uh, surrounding counties, and we need to make sure that the uh, uh, data is provided to them so that they can interview. Contact tracing, uh, I just want to share with you, we have tripled our staff, but retraining re from other programs, cross-training. We have had our environmental health inspectors. They all are doing, most of them are doing contract tracing at this time because restaurants have been closed up to about a week ago. Uh, swimming pools are just starting to open and want it, needing some inspections. Uh, we have used our STD prevention special, specialist that has really worked well, as well as our nurses, because the STD clinic is only open. Uh, in, uh, at a very minimal uh, rate. And now we have hired also temporary workers from the College of Public Health, and we are training them and, and really trying to uh, use them. And we had to refer some of our cases to uh, a team from DHHS that is a, con uh, a contact tracing team because we are getting so overwhelmed with cases. Uh, I mean, 200 cases a day. That's just very difficult to do. And now the cases also seem to ha have language uh, uh, in issues, and we need to have interpreters involved and so on. So it is taking a, a time. I want to share with you a little bit about our Navigator program. I'm really, really proud of uh, that program started last week. And that is really a program when the contract tracers are talking to someone who is now COVID positive and needs to isolate at home. But they may say, you know, it is difficult for us to do that. Or they will ask them, do you have certain needs? And when these individuals say yes, that person will be referred to the navigator team who then will make contact with that individual and say, what is your need? What can we do around you so that you can stay home and, and be safe in this time? The program started last week, and I can tell you the number one issue is that people who need to quarantine or isolate are saying, 
I need food. Food is the number one issue, and they have, the navigators have a, a pretty good program in place with whispering roots and no more empty pots and the food bank, so that they are being delivered packages of food to their homes so they do not have to get out, uh, out of it. The number two one is uh, rental assistance. And these navigators then will know what the resources are in our community and refer them to those resources. Another activity that uh, uh, we have had since the beginning is our information line. And I tell you, uh, we have now, our information line is now running seven days a week. In the beginning, we thought we could stop over the weekend and we could give our call uh, to uh, our, the United Way number. It is important. The questions that are coming in on our information line are difficult questions. They are not simple questions, well, tell me about the symptoms. They are individuals who are on tests. They are individuals who have issues with the direct orders that are out there and want to have a clarification on it. They are individuals who just have a family situations that they want to talk about. So some of these calls can take up to 45 minutes. Uh, where it used to be about, uh, I would say about two weeks ago, and uh, Sunday can talk about this, e there were a lot of people who just were angry. They were angry about the DHM, and they just wanted to have somebody to talk to about it. And now it is more the cause that we are concerned. We are concerned, what should we do? This is the situation we have, and so on. So. Uh, the information line takes about 100 calls every day. They give me a summary at the end of the day about what are the themes of those calls, what questions couldn't they answer or they need some clarification on. So we have really uh, developed uh, a good system. And the last uh, effort that we have going on is, now is planning. Planning for potential mass vaccination because we are already thinking that could actually occur if a, va a vaccine is being developed later this year or actually at the beginning of, the, of uh, next year. So that is uh, going on at this time. Let me just switch uh, quickly over the direct health measures uh, that came out from uh, the governor. And on uh, May 4th, we had two of them that are statewide which are that uh, elective surgeries could be started again in hospital systems, and uh, the direct health measures in regards to churches, that churches could hold services as long as they do uh, physical distancing and with very strict guidelines. But we also had three other categories that were specific to areas, uh, special areas. In our area, restaurants could open at 50% occupancy rate, and then a set of guidelines came out by the Nebraska Restaurant Association how uh, different things should be handled. For example, servers should, should wear masks. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's, it's not a request, or we cannot actually enforce it, but best practice is that servers would wear masks. One of the recommendations is that there always should be two people there, one who handles the money and one who serves the food and so on. Uh, a recommendation is only six people around the table, and uh, from a table to table, there should be six feet. We had a DHM that actually said that hairdressers, beauty salons, barbers, massage parlors could open as long as they uh, enforced the rule of 10, which means only 10 individuals could enter those businesses, excluding the staff. And in those businesses, it was mandatory that the staff and the clients would wear masks. So that is enforceable in those businesses. And the other one uh, that was put in there was daycares. They increased the daycare number from 10 to 15. The reason for it is that if you are opening up businesses, parents need to be able to put their children into daycare, and so it was a necessity. Uh, 
like I said, there were guidelines that were developed for a beauty salon, hairdresser, that sector. There were guidelines that were de uh, developed for restaurants and the churches and the religious services, they also developed their own guidelines. So what's going to come up next? Uh, I think everyone at this time is uh, trying to think what would the next step be uh, potentially in June 1. And so uh, a lot of discussions we have, local health directors have a lot of discussions with the governor at this time, with sectors in our community to see how that will go forward. Nothing has been decided yet, so that, that those discussions are ongoing. I want to share with you just something that has been, that is going to be a challenge for all of us is, I think, how do we open up this economy in a fair way, but also in a way that is protective of public health? So I've spent a lot of hours uh, lately with the school districts uh, because they are really trying to see how can we do this in a safe manner. They really are wanting public health uh, input. I also uh, want to share with you the Omaha Sioux. They have uh, shared with me a really detailed phase three plan, how they would go opening up. And uh, they actually wanted to uh, open up last Monday, May 18th, and have agreed after discussion that they would delay opening through uh, to June 1. And I think that's a very uh, applaudable uh, action that they have taken. But there are questions now about sports events, who can we open, when can we open, how can we do this in a safe manner, and large events uh, are coming up too. I just read this morning uh, in the paper, the chamber uh, reported that they have a report that they are putting out for businesses, and I have actually been in consultation with David Brown uh, pretty soon from the beginning, and he has shared the plan with me and uh, the ch uh, Chancellor Gold, and we have looked at the plan, and it is a very, very, very thoughtful plan, really with public health as, as one of their main goals. But in that plan, and in the article this morning, he is saying that a lot of the decisions that uh, businesses can make are based on a model that comes out of the Global Center for Health Security. It's called the PRAM model, P-R-A-M, Pandemic Recovery Acceleration Model. I just want to share with you quickly as a Board of Health to give you some background uh, what the model is all about. It actually has potentially six different metrics one of the metrics is the confirmed cases, the positivity, per, the percentage of positive cases, and the related death. So those are three metrics. And then it also has three hospital metrics, hospital beds, ICU beds, and ventilators. Mainly what uh, uh, the chamber is looking at are actually the top three metrics, the confirmed cases. And at this time, a benchmark that is being used in the model is 10 new cases per day per million, uh, employ, uh, per million uh, population. So for us, Douglas County, that would mean 8.3 cases per day. So the benchmark is if we will be below eight cases per day, that would be a really good benchmark that we want to be at. If we are above, he has some uh, increased levels of uh, what that would mean to, uh, to businesses. The other benchmark when he looks at, when they are looking at positivity rate is 5% positivity rate per day. So at this time, as I shared with you, we are at 11.4% yesterday. So if the positivity rate would be below 5%, that would really get us into the green range, and that would be a, a good measure to have. In regards to related death, it's uh, 0.17 death uh, per day. For our case, I look at that one death a week. One death a week is really what we should, uh, we should go for. When you have hospital beds, the model has 15% of hospital beds should be available. In our case, that would mean 185 beds. 
means ICU beds, 20% should be available, which is 76 in our case, and ventilators, 80 should be available. And then the model is looking at where is our trend going? And then what is our acceleration rate compared to the previous 10 days? the last three days compared to the previous 10 days. So those are measures that say, are we at least going in the right direction? Are we still ex accelerating or not? And so this is a model that uh, uh, the chamber is using. It's a model that uh, is on the website of the Global, Health, uh, uh, Health, Global Center of Health Security. And it's a model that is really uh, looked at around uh, healthcare coalitions. I just want to make sure you understood it, understand this. There are, I think, six or seven health coalitions across Nebraska. And they collect all the hospital data on a daily basis, hospital beds, ventilator use, ICU beds, or so on. So that information is used in this model for our uh, region, it is the Omaha Metropolitan Healthcare Coalition. That means Douglas County, it means Sarby, it means also uh, Fremont, Was Washington County uh, included in that. So it's, it's a little bit broader. Makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Uh, hospital systems have hospitals in Omaha, but also hospitals in Sarby County, for example and they would all share in their uh, resources. So I just wanted you to have uh, that background too. And that's about uh, all I want to report to the board. Do you have any, any questions from me this morning? I do. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Ford, um, let me ask you a question just in terms of um, the African-American community. Uh, we we talked about that those numbers are really pretty much based, pretty much reflect the demographics of the community. I guess my concern or my question is, is, is that because, is that because there are limited testing in, in North Omaha and do you have a concern about the, the, the amount of testing that's going on? You know, uh, it's, it's a very good question. Uh, I, I'm concerned, I, I think we, all, I, let me just say that, I think we all want more testing. We all do. I hear it every day on the phone calls, people want more testing. So uh, even so, we have provided more testing to North Omaha. It is one of my concerns, it's one of my questions too that I have. So we have actually asked the governor to provide more testing in North Omaha too, as, as we are doing in South Omaha. Uh, I, th I think we all are in the same, we all want more testing. Okay. Uh, I, I do, I am co a little bit concerned about Test Nebraska because that is always what is being told. You know, people should actually enroll in Test Nebraska because that is, uh, a resource we have in our community. So the more you can do any outreach, I know Test Nebraska has some shortcomings. If individuals do not, may not want to do the assessment online, they may not be able to do the assessment online. So we are trying to see what can we, how can we do it better so that people could directly sign up when they come to the site. We have to work through with the governor's office through those, uh, through those issues. My second question has to do with an, with, an, with an organization in town that up to now has kind of been a headache for the city council, but you know, in the city, but we have a gentleman's club that has been operating and they have significant numbers of people in their facilities on the weekend and police attempted to go in and check it uh, to see if they were doing the social distancing and the other things that we were that we want to see, and they weren't let in. I guess my question is, does the, does the health department have the authority to do it in spite of the fact that police can't go in unilaterally by themselves to check? It, I guess that's my understanding. Um, but I, I don't know that any entity ought to have the ability to thumb its nose at the health department and police department and others when we're going through this crisis. 
Yeah, uh, it's hard. It, uh, enforcement of the DHM is really a, an issue with the governor with, on the state level. So the attorney general is looking into that issue as we as we are speaking right now to see what is really the next step. The health department has the authority if it is uh, an infectious disease, a health concern. We do not have that type of information. So I think at this time what enforcement wants to do is they want to make sure that the DHM is being followed. But we don't have any cases that would say this is a, a public health a, emergency from that standpoint. So the Attorney General is looking into this. This is a state issue at the, this time. So it is moving forward and people are looking at it. My third and final comment or question is, uh, I've been made aware that there is, there's being sponsored, and I don't know who the sponsor is, but it's being sponsored that there all, it's an all school uh, get together for the seniors at Levi Carter Park this weekend. Um, I saw it on a social media post. It was sent to me uh, by the mayor's office uh, in a social media post. And I guess I'm wondering, shouldn't we, should we police as well as the health department be proactive and do our own social media thing trying to discourage that mm -hmm. so that we don't have a confrontation between police and others that could have been avoided if we had, you know, if we had been on social media saying, you know, counteracting what they want to do and talking about how dangerous that might be. I think that's a, that's a really good idea, and I will ask uh, Phil to, he's pushing out a lot of information on social media, but specific to that, because we had that incident early on, and uh, we don't want to repeat that. So I'm glad I didn't know about it, because I'm not on social media, I guess. Uh, so thank you, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, I wasn't on social media either. It was sent to me, and so I said we, ought to, we probably ought to address yeah. it if we can. The more we can do up front to prevent incidences, the better, uh, the better we are off. I agree. And fi let me just, let me just uh, add my thanks to the, you and your department and the work that you are doing. And I know Phil is putting out, pulling out, putting out a lot of information. Don't mean to overload him, but you know, we do need to be aware yes. that these things are occurring. Yes, and those are important, they, and they are, ti they are timely, you know, they need, to be, uh, they need to be reported. So I'm glad you are, and please, all of you, you know, when those incidences occur, or when you see something that the department could actually interfere or could prevent from happening, let us know, please. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the, the PPE situation, we're getting, we're getting people calling here all the time asking us to use money for PPE. We should, basically it sounds like we shouldn't be entertaining that. The state should be entertaining PPE. Correct, so the question is often who is, who is getting PPE from the government? Because this is purchased by, uh, by the government, governor. And uh, his response is very clearly, PPE that is purchased by the government is really the priority is for healthcare workers, for workers in correction facilities, emergency response to a certain degree, but really for those individuals who take care of COVID-19 patients. Uh, so that is the highest priority at this time. And uh, I think efforts uh, to provide PPE to other organizations or to community members in general, we need to look for other resources. I want to delve into this question a little bit, and I don't know, I'm just, the, <clears throat> and the thing is trying to stay ahead of this, this number. Um, Omaha is not too different, or Douglas County is not too different, and it's just a mystery to me behind, you know, the, when we first start keeping track of it, the numbers were a little different in regards to the communities of color, and, I, and it's just a mystery to me of why that, that number has changed so much. I mean, is there any hypothesis or anything you're thinking other than the testing piece? Is it, um, I mean, I, I just don't know. That thing, I, I keep feeling like it's a time bomb ready to pop or something. There's just something out there, and I can't believe it's that low a number of people. 
that's there, particularly because when I look at the screen, and particularly when you look at the African American number, that's below the rate. Because when you look at it in the zip codes, um, mm -hmm. you got the high Asian Burmese population that's there, and I have to think that there's, I'm not seeing people wearing masks like they should one, and I got to think that that number is just not that low. And I keep every time I see this, every day it goes down. I'm trying to think what what what's going on. Is there any thought to that somewhere, or any any guesses or anything going on in like any conversations with UNFC or anything where they their thought might be that other than the testing piece? And that's that's kind of a mystery. You know, uh, I ask myself the question uh, often too, but then I think back of on these potential waves that we have had. Remember the first wave was all travelers who came into this community. This is really how it started. Uh, I remember we could potentially say the new, the new case, oh yeah, I had traveled to here or there. So then at that time, we had really a lot of individuals who were Caucasians who traveled and came back. The next phase, it seemed to be, we suddenly had outbreaks in long-term care facilities. That increased uh, again. So we saw the 65 years of and older really increase. Then it went for a while. I mean, I remember very well when we had 40 cases in a week or in a day. That was very reasonable. And then suddenly, I thought the packing industries around us had cases and had outbreaks. But individuals lived in our community, and so the virus went back and forth. And then we saw outbreaks in the packing industries also in our community. If you look at it, uh, Commissioner, 50% of our cases are in the packing industry, and 7% are in long-term care facility. So you could actually say it probably has more to do with uh, where the population works at this time. It really seems to be concentrated. And uh, so that is kind of where I am thinking of, because if you look at the positivity rate that Charles True has and that One World has, One World has a positivity rate of sometimes up to 40%. Where Charles true positivity rate, which goes back to the tests that are being done, is much lower. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I do think it has to do some with the workplace and the outbreaks uh, that are occurring in, in close quarter where people really uh, work closely together and it may be a function of, of the workplace, therefore. So is it a fair assumption, so like Monday's gonna be Memorial Day. These restrictions are relaxed. So you, a little bit, and I don't know how much people are gonna stress these, but should we be looking to the two week out period of June one to see if there's some big burst in numbers being that people may be tempted to get together on Memorial Day? Is, is, is that a, a way to look at this? Memorial Day is gonna be a nice holiday gathering type piece. Could you potentially have a increase two weeks or three weeks later around June one or June eight? Is that a fair way for me to look? That would be very fair, and uh, I hope that's not what we are seeing, but if we are not careful, and if not everybody is taking their own responsibility in regards to social distancing or, or physical distancing, not so much so social distancing, but physical distancing and wearing masks and hand washing, those three things are really important, and we cannot let our guard down, I tell you. Uh, so I hope we are not seeing increases, but I, I tell you, there are, uh, it, it's, it, it's imminent that that is going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just, on your calls, I'm curious what the, uh, so you noted that the line number two is food. Are, are there any, is there any conversation about the food supply being that uh, every time I go in, the, the meat shelves seem bare and the, and the, the price of meat is going up? Are you all delving into that any on these daily calls about what the, the, you know, the food uh, social determinant of why food supply is going to be? Actually, when I'm on a, a community call in regards to food, 
and, and especially also to the food bank. And the food bank had some, uh, some very alarming signs in the beginning of this. They are seeing their food supply is now increasing and their donations are increasing again. From, so from that perspective, I do not. What is going on in the grocery store often is an action of how people function. And I do think once they he heard of the meat packing, there was a little bit this run for meat and so on. But uh, I, I, do, I cannot explain, uh, Commissioner Rogers, why, pr why prices are going up in that industry. No, I'm just wondering if that call with the governor is expanded to that degree because you got mm -hmm. so yeah. many. I'm wondering if some of the uh, health departments out west are talking that. Uh, no, but, okay. they are not. You know, uh, I have to share with you, uh, out in western Nebraska, they have so few cases. I'm, I mean, I'm jealous with them being on a call every morning and, and hearing, you know, we had no case last night or we had one case. And then here come my report, the 200 cases, you know, in a day. So. Uh, okay. All right, I think they're all. When it hit, uh, hit the right when it's red. Okay, there we go. Um, you said we had 2,570 cases, of which 471 have recovered. Is the health department following up on all of those 2,500 cases? We are planning to, yes. Okay. And we have a mortality rate of, of about 1%, and the state has about the same, uh, just a little bit over that. Would you remind us what perhaps the national mortality rate is, if you're aware of that? You know, I think the, yeah. I, I can tell you the okay. national average. I've heard, you know, some uh, some communities as New York has has a, has a much higher rate. So, uh, I think we are. When you look at our rate, we are from a death perspective. The data is is pretty good in our community. Okay. And when seventy five percent are age sixty five or over, yeah. with underlying conditions. Yeah. And then my last question is, that's a lot of statistics and numbers. And thank you for all of that. Is this information and data being reported consistently across the state by the various health departments? You know, it depends. Uh, the data reporting is varied. Uh, I would say, and I'm, I'm just going to say it, I think we have the best dashboard there is because we are transparent. Uh, we try to really uh, look at the data from a race ethnicity standpoint. And what I see even on the state data dashboard, that they do not have that type of specific specificity. So uh, not all of them are reporting in the same way and are reporting the same variables. And I have to say, I have to give credit to some of the smaller health departments who have had outbreaks. They are just overwhelmed sure. at this time and do not have the capacity to report it. But uh, yeah, I have gotten for, uh, calls from the national media who is saying, you know, we really appreciate your dashboard and what can you do? to actually convince the state to also improve their dashboard. Are they in a position to do the type of thorough follow-up that, that our Board of Health is doing as, as far as the cases and following that, the, uh, the outstate boards? You know, that is a best practice. And uh, uh, through the governor, the governor is proposing to have 1,000 con uh, contact tracers. And those contact tracers will be uh, provided as assistance to all local health department. They have about 268 individuals in state government who are now trained to be contact tracers, and those are being lent out to small communities who are overwhelmed at this time. So yes, potentially every community uh, with every case is doing the same thing. The next phase is that the governor is actually thinking of to have, because everybody needs to go back to their normal job, so to say, so those contact tracers, those 268 individuals may not be available for a long of time. So he's now looking at providing contracts to uh, certain private businesses who could do that type of work. And uh, so yes, it is very, contact tracing is probably one of the most important things you can do at this time because only then you isolate them early, then can you stop the, the spread of the disease. Thank you. On the vaccination plan, are we going to revisit potentially dentists helping out, or is that something, I mean, how far have we gotten on to that, the could, mass vaccinations? Could you repeat that again? Are we going to look at dentists helping with the mass vaccinations? 
I, I, I think we have learned a lot from previous years, and so I do, I do foresee, yes. And I will share the, the plan with uh, the board uh, once we have it a little bit worked out, a little bit better, and get input from you, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Celine. Good morning, everyone. Dr. Adipur, I first would like to thank you on behalf of South Omaha community. Um, I would like to thank the Douglas County Health Department and the National Guard for coming to our assistance. Um, I have talked to several community member leaders that are very grateful for them setting up the testing site in South Omaha. I have been on site um, doing interpreting and the community members are just very grateful for that service. Um, one of my concerns with this is, as you might have already answered, is that we have contact tracers calling these people with their results and giving them guidance if there's a positive result. Um, my concern would be, are there contact tracers that are bilingual as well contacting this population in South Omaha? I see. Most of them are, uh, not, not most of them. We have, bi uh, let's say, we have bilingual contact tracers. But sometimes, just from the name, it is very difficult to determine that that is somebody who only speaks uh, Hispanic, for example. So uh, we are trying to do our best. We are using also the language line, uh, and it, ha it has worked very well. But that's what we are looking for. We are looking for more bilingual contact tracers uh, because there is a great need for it. It's not only Spanish. It's Karen and, and other languages now that we are running into that we really need to have uh, much more interpreters about, yes. And if someone is interested in applying for that position, where is it being published? Well, we are not publishing uh, uh, positions at this time, but we have a person who is a, who is taking this all in. It's, it's uh, our division chief, Carrie Kernan. She is the one who is really organizing the logistics person who is organizing staff and so on. Uh, so I would say probably, a, a, do you have her email address or I can, uh, Sunday can provide it to you. Thank you. Yes. Um, my last question would be, are we planning to also maybe move the National Guard around town, um, maybe North Omaha area or Bellevue area? Uh, that is a good question. Bellevue, of course, is Selby County, so uh, that would have, have to be. The uh, South Omaha has been promised that the National Guard would stay there for two weeks. However, what we are seeing is uh, there may be a time that we have less requests or less people coming to that site, and so then I would want to have a conversation with one world, how comfortable they would be to let them move around. You know, it's a big endeavor, as you have seen, and my, I really need to uh, tell you how thankful I was when I saw a picture that Phil posted and, and shared with me because you were at the site on, uh, on Sunday. So I really, really appreciate, uh, appreciate that. We have heard from uh, some other communities that they are not feeling so comfortable with having the National Guard there because there are some issues, maybe history or, or something. So we are working through that and see how, how that would work. But for the time being, it is planned that the Guard would be there for uh, two weeks. And then we need to find some other uh, sources because uh, like you said, Tess, Nebraska, however, is going to move around in the facility, in, in the region. So they are staying in this county and hopefully move around. They are now at the CHI Center, but I would like to see them more in middle of town and also uh, in some of our western smaller communities in West uh, Douglas County, like Valley, uh, Fremont, and so on. Those individuals really need to have access to it, too. But we are in discussion with North Omaha how that would look like. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Again, thank you for your department and all the work they're doing. It's been amazing. So my questions are, and I'm sure of all for any parent of a school-aged child is, and you had mentioned you've been working with school districts on timeline, et cetera. Do you have any indication as far as even just 
when they may make a decision and what kind of conditions need to be in place before they feel comfortable making a decision? Yeah, those are all unknowns at this time. Uh, you know, they are looking at what benchmarks could they look at and how would openings uh, look like for them. So those, I can, couldn't give you any dates at this time. They are really more thinking, what, what phases do we need to look like? They are starting to think about what supplies do we need to have so that we really could open this uh, in a safe manner and uh, a lot of thoughts. And there are some guidelines that the Department of Ed is going to put together, and I think those should come forward in about a day or two or by the end of uh, this week or next week. And it is under those guidelines that each of the school districts uh, is going to work in. Uh, so yeah, I don't have we don't have that, uh, dates yet. I think that's it. Thank you. Do you have anything? Yeah, I guess the your health director report and everything is done and all. Okay, all right. Um, does anybody have questions regarding any of the reports that were uh, submitted um, for the? Uh, Board to read. Okay, Dr. Ford, I may have uh, one just of interest. Um, uh, I guess I'm not, I, I was curious in reading this RIP report. I'm just curious, what are we doing with uh, Nebraska Methodist College with WIC? I guess I never picked that up in the past. It said, you know, for. Um, 685 children were screened in the Douglas County WIC clinics, while 116 were screened by Nebraska Methodist College at eight schools. And I didn't—I thought we were doing totally all that. I'm just curious about that. And if not, I can, you know, follow up with Carrie about it. But that was just uh, something curious that I hadn't noticed before. You know, we always had a contract with uh, Methodist Nursing College, so uh, I foresee, I don't know the exact what, what is going on at this time, but they have done uh, lab testing for, uh, for us for, for some time. Okay. You meant, I think you mentioned a little bit, but I'm just curious, now that some of these restaurants are uh, opening, are we kind of doubling uh, are we doing, are we having any role in compliance or anything like that? Are we getting calls about that or is this totally in the police's hands still? So uh, do we have any role in compliance? Not so much in, comp uh, I think what our role is, is in education, in educating the, about compliance. And Joe Gobb has been out there now for the last few days really to uh, meet with restaurant owners and uh, and say these are the guidelines that you really should you really should follow they've been put together with your sector uh, expertise and so on so that's what he's doing he's also going out on complaints because now we are starting to get of course as you can imagine a lot of complaints from uh, some of the individuals who are visiting these restaurants and then he's also starting to make sure that when individuals are identified positive in restaurants, uh, that quarantine and isolation is being handled appropriately, especially if you have a server who, uh, who comes down ill. So uh, they are starting on a plan to how do they really go forward in regards to going back and inspecting restaurants again now that they are uh, starting to uh, move that up. And uh, they are working together with Dr. Fix on, on that plan. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Okay, we're down to uh, the committee reports. I don't know of any, but let me note. Um, Dr. Ford and I have been having a conversation, and I don't know if the board recalls at one point we had talked about the this ex officio position to add one for housing, and this was a while back, but um, in conversation, there's probably two more that we'd like to propose to the board to add. and. Uh, We'll work to bring, I guess, some names uh, to the board. One probably from the from education, from the school board, and the other from housing. Before, if you recall, we we did have um, participation from the Omaha Public Schools, 
you kind of split the baby with that when Jeannie was in her old role. And now that she's transitioned to a new role, we're talking about Father Green and Ex Officio and how that perspective and kind of complete that element in the, the social determinants piece, but particularly the housing, because as you know, they, with Dr. Poor uh, saying that's in that, that top piece, and it's a lot of discussion after in that respect. So um, if anybody doesn't have anything, we're gonna try to see if we can add those two ex officio points in there. Okay, with that, um, there's no need for executive session. Anything else? Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? There's a motion to a second. Roll call. Faith. Yes. Gray. Yes. McNally. Yes. Rogers. Yes. Espinoza. Twice. Yes. All right. See you all next month. Thank you.